the atheist experience. This is really weird doing this without a uh, live audience. <laughs> Hi, Shannon. How are you? I I can't hear you. I don't I'm know muted myself. <laughs> Hey, welcome to- I don't know who invited me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a That's okay. Hi, Shannon. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to let y'all know that we are uh, work, We are basically volunteering for the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is dedicated to the separation of church and state whenever possible. Uh, if you'd like to support them, then you, there's all kinds of merchandise that you can buy online. Uh, if you go to bit.ly dot a e n merch, then you can get shirts and mugs and so you can get stickers and I think there's hoodies. Um, then we you could also get a membership uh, for as low as a dollar a month, but you can go however high you'd like. Um, but you can get stickers and all kinds of fun stuff um, to be a membership. And then there's also uh, Facebook fan groups. There's um, there's the atheist experience fan group that's public that's out in the open that we can talk about philosophy, develop a community. And then there's also a private one for those of you that are not out as an atheist at all yet. Um, I want to, you know, or you're questioning or anything like that, then you can join the private group. Um, of course, so we have an amazing crew that is putting all of this on. Yay! And Kat! And Kat! Hi, <laughs> <laughs> um, so they are the ones that are behind the scenes working hard on the audio and the video and the mods and all call screening, all kinds of stuff. So if you would like to volunteer, you could email volunteer at atheist-community.org and we can see if you can help. Um, I think that's it. Shannon, did you have Robert. anything? No, I'm just pumped to be here again. You, you and I haven't hosted together, so I'm really excited. This is our... Yeah. It's our first date. <laughs> it is. I love it. I'm really forward to it. I think this Very is going to be an awesome day. So mm -hmm. let's get started. I'm ready. With Hugh in it says the mid south U.S. It says uh, you're a former Catholic questioning. Um, so it says here that you are curious about uh, the definitions of theism, atheism, anti theism. Do you want to start start off talking about that? Sure, that would be great, and that's actually the nature of my call and my question, and it has to do with uh, listening to Matt and others as well talking about logical um, constructions and how he has basically laid out that the opposites are theism and atheism, and I'm kind of coming around to a sentiment where I think if I was going to be honest with myself, I would characterize my mental view of this as anti-theism because of certain things that have happened in my life, certain things that I have uh, educated myself about. I just think that the whole idea of religion is a construct that human beings have created in order to um, address some of the the psychological and physical needs that we have, and also in our um, inability to really reconcile our, um, the fact that we all die. Okay, that was a lot. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> all right, well, let's start off with the definitions. Um, so theism is for people who are theists, people who believe in a deity of some sort. Um, uh, they believe in a god. Um, atheist is simply the opposite of that in that they do not. It's not that they're angry at a God. It's not, it's not anything like that. It's just that they don't have that belief. And so when you see somebody who identifies as something like an anti-theist, that's not necessarily going against either one of those. It's just, it's kind of a, a different term that people kind of use that depending on who they are. I've heard of different, uh, definitions. Um, but one of them is that they're, they're against uh, the, the idea of theism. They're against the construct in general. Um, but that's generally the, uh, what I've heard. Does that help at all? Shannon, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, entirely, because because uh, basically, so then anti-theism is going to fall within this spectrum. Theism and atheism being the bookends, and anti-theism uh, uh, 
as far as your perspective, that's kind of in that in within that spectrum somewhere. See, my I only thing is is this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Antitheism, I think, is like a supplemental sort of belief, like irrespective of whether or not you do believe there is or isn't, you know, a deity to worship. Um, antitheism is more so a perspective about whether or not um, you think belief in, you know, a, a god or in religion is a good thing overall. So I don't know that it would necessarily fall within that spectrum because theoretically, I mean, I don't know why you would, but you could be someone who does believe that a god exists, but also thinks that religion on whole isn't a good thing. That 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 is yeah, within the realm exactly. of possibility. So I don't know. I think it's almost an exist. It exists kind of on a different spectrum because the atheist and theist spectrum where like you would have kind of like an agnostic who doesn't think that you can make a determination in the center of that spectrum um, has to do with whether or not the the beliefs are true and anti-theism has to do with whether or not the beliefs irrespective of whether they are true or false are good for people to have. Does that help clarify a little bit? Right. And so where, so yeah, where no, do you I, fall on that spectrum? If I may clarify, well, I, what I was going to say is this, uh, 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 and Hawk was talking about this as well when he screened me. Um, I, I guess my only question is this. Um, within the spectrum, with theists and atheists, you're still, even if you are, and I, I've, I've certainly watched the show a lot, um, as far as an atheist goes, you don't believe that there is evidence for the beliefs that theists are making, the the uh, the uh, uh, statements that they're making, the beliefs that they have, and everything, but I just question that whether that doesn't actually still validate the entire. Uh, I don't, geez, I'm not sure the word to use. The playing field. In what, other what, words, hold on, hold on, sorry. Before you move atheist, on. Before you move on, I'm curious. What do I'm you sorry. mean? What do you mean when you say when you say that? I, I'm sorry, I lost it. You said that. What validates if we don't believe what Christians say and that we don't believe their beliefs, it, it, it doesn't mean anything about that. It means that we don't believe in a God. But you're, you're still operating within that spectrum. And what I'm saying is, is that I'm, I'm probably, you know, because of my age, it's probably dementia more than anything else. But what I'm saying is, is I believe the whole thing is, is a, a function of our imagination there is no God. There, there are religions that we have created as human beings over the years. They've been affected by political change. Uh, our, our evolution and our growth and spiritual, uh, if you want to refer to it as spiritual, um, growth and everything. And I just think that the, the whole idea that there is no God, it's us. And it's what we do to each other that is the function of what some people are calling a religion or God. And it just seems to me that over the centuries, there has been so much harm and, and death and destruction uh, by people who are devout in their religious beliefs, but feel that that gives them a sense of entitlement yeah. to then treat other people like, like dirt like, like my. I'm curious. I'm curious. You, is this is this a new is this a new discovery that you've made that you think that there is no God? Uh, no, actually, uh, uh, and again, just to give a little bit of history, I actually was born and raised and baptized as a Roman Catholic. I was an altar boy. I was a Boy Scout. I was the quintessential Roman Catholic kid, and this has happened. Actually, I uh, was accused of Star Trek. Uh, uh, sentimentalities uh, in my religious classes because I went to a parochial school when in high school. Well, just to kind of keep the, just to kind of keep the call short, real, real quick, Hugh, just so that we can kind of keep the calls a little bit shorter, so that we can get to more callers. Yeah. We we just kind of like to get to the yeah. root of it, you know. So we really like to get to what you believe now and why you believe what you believe now, rather than the past. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And so, what I believe right now is, is that this is an elaborate facade, that this is something that human beings have created because we're trying to find meaning in our lives and everything, and because we're so intimidated by the fact that those we care about and love die left and right, and we're all going to die. 
and I think that it's just compensating for this this feeling of uh, non belonging. So I guess if I was going to come right down to it, I don't think there's a supernatural, and I think I am an anti theist. That's great. Well, the, the, ha we're go. happy to share that small part of your journey with you. <laughs> yeah. Is that all that you wanted <laughs> to share? Sure. And I, I just want to say, Shannon, thank you so very much because I happened to watch the show one time where you were kind of going at the gentleman that was finding a hundred messages in the first line of the oh, Bible. Geez. Yeah. And yeah. you just <laughs> dive about statistics. And girlfriend, I seriously, I was just, I wanted to hug you if I would have been near you and, uh, and you know, it wouldn't have been intimidating. But I thought, go girl. <laughs> yeah, thank <laughs> thanks. You. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for the support, Hugh. Have a good one. Thank you. Okay. Good night. All right. All right. You want to pick the next one, Shannon? My turn. Okay. I, I do. This is fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm going to, let's talk to Kenny. We're going to talk to Kenny. Hi, Kenny. Hi, Can Kenny. Hey, how you doing? Oh, good. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. You're talking to Shannon and Jenna. What would you like to talk about today? Well, I just called to meet the basic requirements of telling you who my God is and why. Oh, neat. Okay. Okay. Can we start with what the definition of your God is? <clears throat> the definition of my God? Yeah. Like, if you had to uh, define I, your God in a way I that comports to the to scripture. Define. Well, I just adhere to the biblical God. Okay, what does the biblical God look like if you define it? You believe in it, so you must understand what its components are, what it, what it's comprised of, why it's possible. Well, so what's the definition of your God? Because there's multiple definitions of the Christian God, even within the Christian theological understandings. You could, you could adhere to classical theism. You could, I mean, so... I guess the, the best way for me to start understanding what your perspective is, is to know what God you believe in, even within the paradigm of Christianity. So could you please just define the God that you believe in? And if you can't define the God, why do you believe well, in it? I, I believe in the God that is defined in the beginning in Genesis as the, the I am. What properties order. does it have? Why do you have to describe it from somebody else's point of view? Why can't you describe it from your own point of view? Why do I? Well, because my God is the one that's in the Bible. I don't, I didn't fashion it myself. Well, so I'm just curious. Do, do you have any experiences with this God? Well, yeah, that's why. I mean, I accepted. I was technically... My parents didn't raise me as anything because my parents, my dad was a Catholic. He was German Catholic. And my mother was Presbyterian. And the doctrine of the Catholic Church is that you have to be Catholic when you're married. Otherwise, it's not a real marriage. So mm -hmm. the Catholic priest told my dad that his sons were all bastards. So nice. actually my dad <laughs> left the church. But hmm. he was I'm sorry, I interrupted Shannon's line of questioning. Um, yeah, so, so you wanted to explain to us why you, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Kenny, but you wanted to explain to us why you believe in the Christian God. So in order to progress the conversation, right. I guess right now we have an understanding that you don't know what the definition of God would be for the God that you believe in, but it comports to uh, okay. scripture that would be Yahweh, Yahweh the self exists. God, he's the God that always existed. I mean, I don't, I don't know how anybody defines him, but he's the God that came in mortal flesh called Jesus and uh, created the cosmos. That sounds like a definition to and, me. Uh, almost 6,000 years ago. So, so how, just, how oh, do you no, know this? I, more or less an atheist. I was raised yeah. more or less an atheist because okay. The Catholic priest told my dad we were all bastards, and so my dad kind of didn't raise us, and my mom didn't raise us in the church. So okay. I accepted Christ at 18 years old. Right. Why? After having no. learned nothing For about What it. reason? What brought you to that? Like, your, your backstory well, I, is, I'm, I'm sorry that that, yeah. So what I'm really interested in, what line of thinking brought you to adopting the belief? And if you're incorporating the, your backstory as, uh, you know, Catholicism, 
being something that uh, wasn't good for you, and then you became an atheist into that story. That makes me, if you're incorporating that into your explanation as to why you believe, that leads me to believe that that component of your life fed into you adopting this belief as opposed to analysis of whether or not it's true. Is that the reason that you're telling me those yeah, things? I'm, just, uh, I'm telling you that because I was basically a blank slate when I came to Christ. I didn't know anything about religion okay. at all. Sure. I so, basically like an atheist. My well, what do you know now, zero. though? Because it doesn't. Right. What do you know now, though? Because well, it doesn't sound like you have a, a solid definition for God. Well, I, I don't know how to describe them to you because, uh, well, I've because... been a Christian for quite a while, so I. So I, why can't I, you I describe him? Describe him to you. Well, I've told you he's the self-existent God. He's Yahweh. He's he's a God. Well, what does that mean? From all time. What does self-existing mean? That means he had no creator. He is how the do creator. He's, well, okay, so if he's, some, he's if God. something. Is there anything else that is self-existing? No. So then why are, why are we... This is the one and only thing that you're saying that exists that was not created. And you cannot describe it. And you cannot give any kind of details about it because you say that you don't really have any experiences with it. You've just heard other people reference it. But so why are you so convinced that it even exists? That's my question. If, if it wasn't created and you have no evidence that it exists, why believe in it? I never said I had no evidence. We've asked for it and you haven't given it. Like we've asked you to describe it, which would be. Yeah. We're asking you to describe him. You didn't ask okay, for sorry. Not asking for a description now. What is your evidence that this God that you cannot describe exists? Because I don't know if you can't describe it. Well, I mean, basically all of history kind of describes yeah. theism. And uh, no, it, that, that's but, not an answer. I, I can say all of I can I can if I can make the exact same statement and it's ambiguous enough that it would support anything I say, that's not considered evidence. I could say all of history supports that. Anything. <laughs> all of history supports that Allah, all of history. So like literally that's everything. That's me just saying yeah. everything supports it. With, without pointing to any connection between everything and how everything constitutes support. So that's, a, that's such a broad statement well, as to history, be utterly meaningless. Well, history does support Allah. I'm not saying it doesn't. History supports all of the gods. I didn't deny any of that history. Well, but that's the thing is it's not even that it supports all of the gods. It's that it supports all of the fairies and all of the aliens and all of the monsters and the Bigfoots and the, you know, it supports everything. Right. Also supports all of the atheism. Do you understand sure. how we could we could throw out that answer as evidence for anything mm -hmm. and it'd be just as valid as what you just said? So can you give us anything that is a little bit more concrete? Concrete for evidence? As some kind well, of evidence that's not I'm just not a general atheist. statement. Atheist, so I, don't, I don't I don't throw out all the history. I, I accept it all. Okay, so not, we're not talking about this. Okay, you know what? Okay, Kenny, I, I am coming to my last straw here. You cannot say that all of history supports anything. And if you give that as your answer for why you believe in a God, then that is a ridiculous reason. And I don't know what else to say to you. Um, but can you give me any other reason? Well, other than, other than history supports it. Well, I can tell you why I became a Christian. I would like to know what evidence you have that any God exists. Well, my threshold of evidence is lower than yours, apparently. I don't, you don't know what my threshold is because you haven't given me anything to work with. We're, done, we're just asking you to answer the question. And so far, your answer to the questions have been, and you have to, Kenny, 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 Kenny. So I just want to summarize your answers thus far. We said, can you define a God? And you said, no, not really, but Bible God. Okay, fine. Well, what evidence do you have? Literally the entirety of history and all of reality, evidently, is your evidence. 
and why you believed in the God. And you're, you said, well, clearly my threshold of evidence is lower than yours. Not one of the answers that you have given have drawn a line between any sort of evidence or experience that you've had and why you even believe in God. Like right now, if somebody asked me, why does Kenny believe in God? I don't have an answer for them. And I can't just say, cause history happened. Cause that would be weird, right? Well so let's say, let's say, well, let's say Shannon, Shannon and, I, and I, hold on, let's say Shannon and I were like blank slates and we were atheists and we didn't have any beliefs in a God and you wanted to convince us, you wanted to convince us, not about, not just describe what you believe, but you want us to believe too, correct? Of course I do. Okay, so how would you convince us as two people who would like some evidence? that there is a God, that it exists at all. Not even, let's not, let's try, please, if you don't mind, to not go into the details of which religion or anything. Let's just start at square one. Let's start at any God that you that you believe in. Let's start with that. Why should either one of us believe that th that, that God exists? Well, as I said, I, I believe history and, and I believe that Why the history- Why should we believe? Can you real though? Why do you, you think, believe it? Why do you think why that we should believe it just because you believe it? Well, I I accepted Christ at 18 years old, so there's not so, much I could so have. So my known question is, do you old. think that we should believe it just because you believe it? Well, I'm just saying that I yes didn't or know. No. You want me to present Yes or no, Kenny? I wouldn't have it. Kenny? Eight, yes at or 18 no? Years old, what? Yes or no? You should believe, you should believe, babe. Hi. <laughs> Jenna hit the wall. I like that question. I like that question. Thank Do you think we should believe? That's a really good question. Since, right, I, hung up on your I, person, <laughs> since I hung up on your person, do you want to pick the next one? We can, we can try this again. <laughs> Round two. Okay, sure. Sorry, Kenny. <laughs> I wasn't ready. Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, we're, we're going to, we're going to talk to Mike because... He deserves to be talked okay. to because I need to know that. I just need okay. to know. Okay, Mike, hi. We our notes say that you can use math math to prove things that cannot be proven. And I need to know what that means. <laughs> so we're hey. hoping this is like a language barrier that, that we yeah. might be misunderstanding you in some way. I'm very curious. Uh hello? Hello. Hi. hello. Yeah. I mean <laughs> uh hi hi Jenna. Hi Shannon. I hope you're doing fine. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would have hung up on the other person as well. Um, <laughs> it's it's hard to talk about it. I'm not gonna give a a course in mathematical logic. Okay. Um. So what are you gonna oh, use to talk okay. to us about? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm studying math, and mm -hmm. it's mathematical logic. Um. It was actually proven in 1931 by someone called Kurt, Kurt Gödel. And what I'm was proven? Gonna... Okay, so if you have an, a set of axioms in, that describes the natural numbers, for example, mm -hmm. um, deriving from those axioms, you can never get all true, um, all, all true theorems, all true, true statements. So... I'm not sure I under, I'm oh, following. There's some, following. some delay. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, as I said, it's, it's, it's theoretical mathematics. It's, it's, lo it's mathematical logic. Mm -hmm. And basically, if, if you have a set of axioms, so things that you assume to be true, for example, mm -hmm. pathologies, equality axioms, stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, and you, you, and everything that can be deduced from them, mm -hmm. um, then there is a gap between all true statements and what can be deduced from them. So what is basically done is, in a way, um, things can be, even within mathematics itself, can be self-referential. And it, it, it's, very, it's very hard to describe. It's graded course mathematics, um, so... It, it's hard right. to describe, but basically, so you're, are you saying is, that nothing can be proven with math, with math, or that is that what you're trying to say? That nothing really can be proven because no, 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 even no. with math. What are you trying to say then? 
No, I'm just saying that that there are true statements mm -hmm. which cannot be derived. What does that mean? There are true statements that cannot be derived. You saying that there's true statements that so cannot have, be. How are you so, using so the word for, true? For example, um, well, you, you have a, a set of rules, a set of mathematical rules. For example, modus ponens. This is usually used. Is uh, this is if you have if you have a statement A and you have A implies B, then you can logically follow B. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 not gonna try to do this and and to. I think I might be understanding. Are you I'm, saying I'm, that eventually you're gonna get down to like a base axiom where you really kind of need to have a presupposition about it, like you exist or the universe exists, and you can't derive a mathematical no. formula from it? Has to be like is that what you're trying to say? No, um, that there's actually also something that is proven that you cannot add axioms in order to okay. arrive there. So, okay, I mean, I think we're getting lost here. Yeah. I'm not even. What, yeah. what, to to what end are we having this conversation? Are we having this conversation just to say <laughs> that there are some things that math can't prove? Because I would just, you know, prove patient, just agree with you and be like, okay, and then, <laughs> and then we wouldn't really need to, <laughs> to go on anymore. No, I'm I'm I'm. I've I've said it in my in my in my topic question that unfalsifiability mm -hmm. is something that Matt often use and a lot of people often use, and mm -hmm. I and I understand it and it, it works. But the the concept of improvability is that even though some things are true, you cannot prove them. Um, yeah. And I'm not talking yeah. about something like complex complexity or something uh, complexity. Sorry. I'm not talking about the proof would be too long or we are just too ignorant to understand. So I want to make clear that what I'm saying is not out of, not a logical fallacy from ignorance, you know, but it's, okay. it's mainstream mathematics that, um, yeah, I mean, you could, you could look it up whenever you want. It's the theorems of incompleteness within mathematical logic. Okay. And then Except there's also that. some other things. Um, well, so Basically, hold on. Before you move on to other things, what are you are you trying to prove anything? Yeah, are you, are you trying to prove that no. anything supernatural exists at all? I think this no, is an attempt. No, education. no, I, I'm I, I'm an I'm an atheist yeah. just just like you, but um, well, what I'm just saying is requiring proof for something is not necessarily um, rational. Um, oh, and, and yeah, I we're getting don't somewhere. want to. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> now you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right. So you're yeah, saying and, that and Matt... I don't want this to be hijacked. I don't want this to be hijacked by anyone, by any fears or something, because they probably don't understand the underlying both mathematical and philosophical consequences of, of those mathematical theorems, right? Okay. So, are you, may I ask, and, and are, it, are you saying yeah. that, that since, uh, since it kind of... I've been studying logic um, here and there, and I've kind of come to the conclusion after going really deeply that it kind of, you come to a point where you have to use logic to prove logic. Is that kind of what you're getting at? That because of that, that you can't really, that you can't really expect us, expect people to use it? Um, no, because you, there's, there are obviously some things within logic that you can, um, you can prove thing, a lot of things using, using logic and using mathematics and physics and so on and so forth. Um, but it, that there usually is this, is this notion of that there is no, no, uh, no, no ceiling, right? That as long as humanity keeps going and as long as we are smart enough and there are no, um, um, like a proof would not be too long or too use too many atoms or something like that, that everything can be proven at some point or disproven. Right. Mm. Um, but as, as these theorems show is there, there actually is a, is a gap there between, um, well, the theory of arithmetics, for, for example, which is the natural numbers, and what can, what can be deduced from axioms. So 
also when, when we use it in our everyday simple life, if we would have some axioms and, and you know, say, what can we deduce from those axioms only using logic, then there's also a gap, you know? Or right. we would think that there would, will also be a gap. Uh, yeah. I'm lost. Oh, I yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to let you go because I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I kind of blanked out <laughs> part, part way through there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really did. I appreciate it. I'll have to, like, I don't have the background required to... Yeah get myself up to the level of understanding that I think is even required to have this conversation right now. And I'm still a little bit lost as to why we are. So I'm really sorry. I appreciate it. But uh, I'm going to let you go. And thank you. And please call back again sometime. And Jenna, it's your turn. Tag your it. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Tag and you're it. Jenna. <laughs> um, oh, no, did I just hang up on the person that I wanted to click on? Uh Oh, did I hang up on them? No, I hung up on. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, here it is. Oh. <laughs> Solomon in Washington thinks that oh, abortion God. should be illegal because it would be taking a life from another person. Okay, before before we hear your story, Solomon, I'm curious how you define like life and person. Like, what is life to you, and what is person to you? How do you use those words? I I guess fundamentally that's the real question here. <laughs> yeah. So. It depends on when we define life. So I think if they're defining life, and some people define it differently than I do. Um, for me, I define it at a heartbeat. That happens relatively early on and pretty quickly after the realization of, oh, I've missed my period. Mm -hmm. um, so I think pretty much around that time would be a fair time to say that that would be life, in my opinion. I could be completely wrong. Other people believe other things. So it's actually but not really a heartbeat, though, when it's still in that early phase. Is, it's a, that's an electrical impulse that registers similar to a heartbeat, but you actually don't have a circulatory system like shortly after okay. you're impregnated. What the, the thing okay. that's registering on um, ultrasounds as a heartbeat is actually actually a, an electrical mm -hmm. impulse. The circulatory system, as people understand it, okay. doesn't quite so, exist. So that's just a valid correction. If, but, if that is, but it's a valid, valid and important one to note if that is your definition of when life starts is when, uh, it's not mine for the record, but okay. if that is yours, um, you're placing it at the wrong time during fetal development. So just heads up there. Sorry, didn't mean okay. to interrupt so you, but I thought that was important even, to note. Even with that, even with that impulse. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So even with the impulse or, or the electrical pulse, I, I think it would still stand because um, afterwards, unless there is something to alter that, it's still going to become a human life. Like the, the so, course of, it happening prior doesn't really change. Like it's, it wouldn't be no different than a person that has um, a hard birth and they could potentially die, but then you have doctors who saved the life and then it's still alive. You know, you wouldn't kill the baby afterwards or you, you know, it, okay. I, that's what I'm trying to say. So, so I'm curious before we get, before we get too deep into this, is, is this belief um, based on a God belief, is this because it, you think this is what a God wants or is this actually a separate belief for you? Uh, it's no, it's completely separate. It's not related to theism at all, but it, I mean, okay. I can talk about theism. I have no problem with that. Well, I'm, the reason is because if, if it is, then we should, we should definitely talk about that instead. But if it's separate, then it's, it's own legitimate issue. Um, so, yeah, so whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm down to talk about theism as well. Either is fine with me. Well, we've already started on abortion, so we can we can go with that. Um, so no. you no. think that the life starts when there are there is a beat of some sort, whether it's a heartbeat or an impulse or whatever. Um, you yeah. think that that is when life starts, and that is when it becomes a person, correct? Like by person, you mean somebody with like a personhood. Yeah, like what would be the difference between a baby, like a four-month-old baby, and a fetus, essentially? Well, I would say that the four-month-old baby has been born. have things that require it. Sorry? I, I would say that the four-month-old baby has been born. I would add to that that also a four-month-old baby has the ability, prefrontal cortical development required to have cognition and self-awareness. 
is also been born and is self-aware. And on top of that, uh, is no longer dependent on uh, another human being's body um, to exist. It is is fundamentally capable of living independently, which is a notable difference okay. when we're talking about. Well, well, so the fact is that, that so yeah, so you, hold on real quick before we move on. So you think that it should be wrong um, that or that it is wrong. And, and I can understand that. But but you also can understand, I think you said earlier, how other people can disagree with you, correct? Yes, but to address that, I have to say uh, about the four-month-old baby. Okay. Right, so the idea that a four-month-old baby is going to survive on its own is not true. Uh, it needs people in order for it to survive. Mm -hmm. It's still when I say survive it's on its own, I mean survive right? without needing to be scale. physically attached. No, 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 one sec, because this is a conflation that I hear all the time, that, you know, once you have a baby, the baby requires okay. attention and care. Like, it can't feed itself, obviously, duh, right? Once you've had the baby and you've committed yeah. yourself to taking care of the baby, that you'd be negligent to not to, right? Like, once you give birth. I agree with that. But the differentiation that we're talking about here... Like the way I let me let me start by clarifying the way that I view abortion. I view abortion as me relinquishing the right to my body to even if you're I'll grant you I will 100% grant you for the sake of argument just for the sake of argument. Let's say that the moment of conception, like the moment that sperm hits egg, zygote forms, we'll just call that life. We'll call that human life. And just for the sake of definition throughout the entirety of this conversation, I will grant you that as a premise. Now, at what point does okay. that life have? have rights that supersede my right to my own body is the question here, right? That's the important question. So oh, once okay. a four month old baby is out, a four month old baby no longer needs to be physically attached to another human and utilize their body's resources. And this is this would be illustrated by this argument. This is a counter to your point. Once I get the moment I give birth to a baby, let's say that baby needs a blood transfusion. That baby needs a blood transfusion. I'm the only one around who can give that baby a blood transfusion. And I am that baby's mother and just gave birth to it. Should I be forced to give that baby a blood transfusion to keep it alive? It has been alive for one second outside of my body. Do I have to give it a blood transfusion? Should I be forced to do that? Answer that question for me, please. I think that's a, I think that's an unfair question to ask because it's not Why? necessarily directly related. Like it, the, the that actions directly that, related. So, that baby will. No, 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 no. It is. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you wash over the question because it absolutely is directly related. Because your argument is that I need to use my body to provide the requirements of life for that baby. Now you're saying that when that baby is in my room, I am required to provide my body for that. But once the baby leaves my room, I am no longer required, which means that you have a double standard when you're looking at this. You're saying when the baby is inside no, no. of me, well, 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 I am. Let me back. Well, well, we have to step back a little bit to be able to address that. Okay, okay right. go ahead. So the baby has no has no has no ability to determine what it's doing in its life, right? I mean, it's not at fault here. It's not the one who chose to live. It's the person who decided to have a had relations, and then they decided to have a baby. That's their when you get into a car, you consent to a car accident if you get in it. It's not the same. It's not the same. You you can't okay. use that as an argument. You can't say just because there is a possibility that engaging in sexual activity will result in a pregnancy that you are that that you consent to that pregnancy that you consent to your body being used in that way any more than you can say that there's a realistic understanding that if you get into a car there's going to be an accident that you consent to having an accident. Yeah, but the person who is the victim of the accident isn't responsible for being there. If I'm the victim the of some of getting pregnant, it's a, what about a rape then? Like the more you keep justifying why these analogies don't don't okay. track, so, so, or the so, more so you're actually raping your scenario. Which ultimately does boil down to bodily autonomy. It is my body, and if I do not want it to provide it to someone, I do not have to, and there is no reason that I should be forced to. Even if I make the decision, like if I, like, a, in, let's say that I, I, if, even if I stabbed you, even if I stabbed you, I still am not forced to give you a blood transfusion, right? If I made the choice to do that to you, I am now responsible for that okay. happening to you. But you still, in that scenario, can't use my body to maintain your life. The only place that this argument seems to hold for people, for whatever dissonant reason I don't understand, is when it comes to a woman's body in pregnancy. Every other time, you don't have to relinquish a part of yourself. Your bodily autonomy takes precedence. But as soon as a pregnancy is involved, regardless of the stage of the pregnancy, all of that goes flying out the window because 
you're a mom now you decided to have sex and now that baby owns your body and so do i by the way because i get to have a conversation with you telling you what you have to do based on my ideas and understanding about what your body is for so you'll excuse me if i get a little bit heated when i have these conversations because i can make those decisions for myself Thank you for that. I hung up on him about a minute ago because he was muted a couple times while you were talking and he was still talking the entire time. So thank okay, bye. you. Bye. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, com I completely agree with what you said and I'm glad that you were able to say it. Uh, it is your turn to pick. Oh yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing so well so far. <laughs> <laughs> I got such a good track record so far. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, uh, okay, we're going to talk to Martin. All right, Martin. Can you hear us? What would you like to discuss today? You're talking to Shannon and Jenna. Hello, Martin. Hey, Martin. Martin, did, we, did, I, did I scare you away, Martin? <laughs> um, okay, we'll return him to the queue and come back to him. You want to pick another one? Yeah, sure. I'll pick another one. We will go with, um, dun, dun, dun. how about Jack? Jack's been on for a while. Hi, Jack. How are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? Hi, pretty good. <laughs> um, good. So I know both of you pretty well because I've been watching the Atheist Experience for many years. So you know us pretty well. Calls. I'm a Canadian <laughs> as well. So um, okay. it's nice to talk to another Canuck. Um, so Indeed. I'll get straight to my point. Okay. Um, so basically, I believe that God does provide evidence for, and I'm just going to use his because it's simpler, but, you know, there's yeah, certainly the a mass on the sides of God. But anyway, um, I'm going to say his. But um, so basically my, my grandparents on my mom's no, side. No, 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 sorry. Before you go into your story, can you clarify what you're going to do? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about synchronicities and ways in which coincidences in our lives can point to bigger truths. So coincidences, have you convinced that a God exists? Well, interesting coincidences. I'm not talking about, like, my my brother and I have the same birthday. Or you know what I mean? Like, I'm not... Just to decide what's interesting. Minor stuff like that. Well, I'll explain it, and you can tell me whether or not it's meaningful. How sure. Let's hear you out. What's up? Okay. So basically my mom lost both her parents within about three months due to really extreme aggressive forms of cancer. And it caused a lot of grief for her. And she actually left the church for a while. She was a Christian and Catholic. Well, she kind of was like, she didn't love Catholicism, but she believed in God and she hated God for a long time. Right. And she would always go to like her parents' graves to pray and talk to them. And uh, well, they died in 94. In 2004, my dad got a job in California, and we got the chance to move to California, which is every Canadian's dream. So we took it, and my mom was really, like, praying as to whether or not this was a good thing. And she mm -hmm. talked to her parents about it and said, please give a, me a sign. I just want to know a sign, something that this is okay. So maybe a week or two later from that, my dad got our new number, her phone number in Long Beach. The number ended 3435. So with, well, with our, okay, that's a easy to remember number. So he tells her and my mom gets this weird instinct to kind of dig a little bit because there's this weird overgrowth. So she shortly discovers after hearing the number that the grave plots the entire time, she didn't know the numbers. They were just put there were 34 and 35. And, you know, that's a one in 10,000 chance, like not perfect. You know, I know like a one in a million chance would be more, impressive mm -hmm. but it was really powerful for me. and it was very healing for her because when she lost her parents um it really really messed her up for a long time and she's still you know not having parents and i only really knew right. my grandparents very little they were amazing people and jack my grandfather um he would hide quarters in tree stumps and tell us that pirate ships came up the creek and we believed them, of course. That's great. So but, Jack, I mean, Jack I'm going to stop you for a sec though. Pretty crushed, but go ahead, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm so sorry. I do, it's it's just we we have limited time, and so I, I don't I don't mean to interrupt you Go to ahead. be rude because you see you seem like love like a lovely person. Um, but I do want to say that like if you're posturing this as some sort of proof, I can see why anecdotally a lot of people might look at something like this and it may resonate with mm -hmm. them, right? They may they may say, oh wow, you know that coincidence has a very strong emotional tie. So when it, when a coincidence has a strong emotional tie like that people are more mm -hmm. prone psychologically to lean into it right because they feel oh, a connection absolutely. so but but when you're Have positing you that Jack, please listen. But, Jack, one sec though one sec one sec one sec sorry but when you're when you're positing that in, in a conversation as some sort of proof that should be compelling to somebody else you have to understand that that just couldn't be just the fact the fact that you even yourself were able to say okay, listen like there's a one in ten thousand chance that this would happen like there is mm -hmm. coincidences like that happen every day so i don't other. understand how you would want would let would expect us to draw connections um to, well, like me, what like what about telling me this story reason. made you like, think that i would go well shit, god is real then what no one's ever put it to me that way before well, here's the thing, you know here's what, I, what i realized right <laughs> one thing i yeah. realized from all of this and these happen to me all the time and on a smaller scale or bigger scale but um, what I realized is we're never going to have sufficient evidence as to whether or not God exists. That is Stop right there. Stop right there. Sure. Stop right there. Stop right there. You just said we're never going to have sufficient evidence to believe in a God. Why would you keep going? Perspective. Why would you keep going? From the scientific method. From the scientific method is what I'm talking about. We're never going to be able to have a better method where we can prove or disprove God. Right. Okay, hold we on. Agree with that, hold right? on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I, I had something really important to say about the coincidences because that's really the reason that you call you, you have all these coincidences, coincidences that you say keep happening in your life. Please understand, there mm -hmm. are so many words and numbers that are in your life now that have been in your life in the past. Mm -hmm. Locker numbers, cell phone mm -hmm. numbers. Mm -hmm. Hold on, please, please listen to me when I'm talking just for a minute, okay? Um, so there are all oh, kinds of fun. words, all kinds of foods, all kinds of emotional words, you know, there's middle names, mm -hmm. there's, there's all kinds of things, all kinds of things all over your life mm -hmm. that can mean something is uh, tied to you because it feels like it is because you feel like you kind of own those words. They're a part of you. I can understand how that can feel mm -hmm. like something is speaking to you. Something is obviously yours speaking directly to you because of that connection. But the fact is that everybody mm -hmm. has so many of those. And so when you think about what are the chances that I could have that kind of a connection, I'm not done talking, Jack, Jack, when you ask, what are the chances okay. that something like that can happen? I'd say that they're pretty high. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to go back to what you said and I want you, I'm confused because you said, everybody has so many of those I, like, yeah what do you mean when you say that i don't really because not everyone's a theist a lot of people don't believe in that well, well what i mean is that there are so many words that could signify mm -hmm. that a sign is reaching out to you for example for me um my dad used to call me little mm -hmm. bird so anything that has to do with a bird which <laughs> there's all kinds of bird mm -hmm. stuff out there um you know there's anything birds, that yeah. has to do with the color pink, because that's my favorite color. You know, there's so many things about me that that make me who I am. And so I can understand how it can mm -hmm. feel like when those words are being used, that it's, it's trying to signify something, it's trying to tell me something. But but mm -hmm. I could I could also understand how that's just a human desire to want to feel like you belong, to want to feel like you belong here. I agree. So no, why would so now that now that being said, and yeah, having and you having said yourself that we can never have sufficient evidence to believe this stuff, why are we going to say that because coincidences like that happen, that obviously a God exists because we we just we don't find that convincing at all? That's a great response. And I expected you to say something like that. Um but here's okay. how I would respond to that. I want to kind of reframe that a little bit because I feel like science is great at looking at our, you know, reality as far as the three dimensional, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time that we can perceive. Mm -hmm. And it's a really good tool for that. But I don't think it's a great tool for asking the 
the why kind of questions. It's great at asking the how questions of how does this work? How does that work? What about the what so questions? Ask, like, is there a God or why what about, is the universe or whatever? What about the what questions, I Jack? Solve that. What, what, what do you mean, what questions? What type of what, what exists? Questions? Well, the word exists, if you just ask someone a question, what exists, that's a really hard question. Like the shorter a question like that, like we know we exist. I think we can all agree that existence is real, right? Like we, we're talking. So, so we that's that. thing. This is, this is a like, big I'm, conversation actually in the atheist community. This is a very big topic on what is real, what exists, what is true. Because when we really, really mm -hmm. dig down deep, it gets really confusing. But that's the thing is that it just gets more confusing. Yeah. We don't find more answers yet. We find more questions. Every time we answer a question in the scientific community, we open up 15 more questions. Right. Um, it's an interesting theory. I, I studied the history of science and every time you learn something new in the scientific community, you open up 15 more questions. So mm -hmm. actually over yeah. time, the percentage of questions we know the answer to goes down I would agree with that. Questions open up every time we solve the problem. And that's but how does, the problem with <laughs> atheism, in my opinion. My humble Jack, opinion. Jack, no, Jack, 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 one sec. One sec because, the, like, I, I don't understand how you're not seeing what I think both Jenna and I see here, which mm -hmm. is you're saying there are so okay. many questions that are unanswered that, so, that it's unreasonable to say that we know answers to questions. But then simultaneously, you're mm -hmm. saying, here's something that we can't, there's, uh, there's really no way for us to empirically prove, yet I believe it. And you're acting as the worthy, unreasonable <laughs> ones when we're saying, yeah, there's all of these unanswered questions that we don't have the answers to. And you're saying, well, there's this one thing that we really can't even prove whether or not it is or isn't true, but I believe it anyway, but acting as though that's okay. the reasonable version. Mm -hmm. You see? see? That's a very fair that response. I, well, I appreciate that that you said that, Shannon, because I think it can be very confusing when I talk to people because I use a lot of terms in different ways. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say at its core, if I had to sum it up in one sentence, is that um, believing in God is something I do out of more of a belief in my heart, not in my head. Like there's some things I believe in my head, like, you know, math or science or what whatever does that mean? I believe. Like everything you believe is in your head, Jack. In my head. You're just so you're just saying you have an emotional connection you, to you it. Know. That's in your head too. <laughs> well, no, it's interesting because your gut bacteria contribute to your cognition, as does aspects of your heart function. So, so does this brain. gut bacteria so only apply when we're when we're trying to investigate a God belief? But what I'm saying is this, right? So sometimes you got to think with your head. Sometimes you think with your heart. Sometimes you think with your gut. So what oh, I don't know. Is this? It's that a funny all of it's in your head. It. That's, that's nonsense to and, me. Okay, you're going to have to. So Shannon's got a psychology <laughs> degree. She, she's studying. Hold on, Jack. Hold on, Jack. Hold on, Jack. You have you have on the line a woman who has actually studied the human brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you actually awesome. studied the human brain? I have bipolar disorder. So that doesn't I, tell me anything that you've studied. Well, I was sent to the hospital six times and I've seen the craziest aspects of human behavior. Oh my God. Do you think that people. because you've been to the hospital six times that you understand how the human brain works? Of course not. I can't even begin to fathom the depths of the human brain. It's a, Okay, it's so a that is my brain. point. You can't even fathom the depths of the human brain. And here we have somebody who can help you understand the depths of the human brain. I would love somebody to. who can help you understand why we don't actually think with our gut and our heart. We actually think with our brain. Do you have any questions for Shannon? Well, me, I have a question for Shannon. If you sure. have to tr decide whether you want to marry someone, a man or a woman, I don't know you very well. Um, Could be either. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not going to make assumptions, but anyway. Um, so no, I just declared it, so no need. You're, the day before, right? The day before, are you going to run through a mental checklist of all of the things and say yes, no, yes, no, and then if it sums up more than 50%, you marry them? Or are you going to make a more intuitive choice? Now, I know it's metaphorical, whoa, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, hold on. You asked your question. And now she's going to answer it. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let her. No, 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 Jack, okay, Jack, Jack, I will mute you. <gasps> She'll do it, Jack. <laughs> she's not messing around. You ask a question, and now okay. you give her time to answer. 
<laughs> okay, I'll shut up. Is, thank you. Okay, so Jack, your question essentially boils down to, if I'm understanding it, when you're in a highly emotional situation, are you going to think emotionally or logically or some combination of the two? That's what the question seems to be trying to tie itself mm. into. Right. So I'm getting married. What factors into my decision about getting married? Now, the answer is going to be different. Like if you look at some research about like people who get married, like first and second marriages, the mm -hmm. factors that determine what mm -hmm. what their, what their decision making process is going into marriage changes. And the reason it changes is because of experience. And once people have experience, they understand that just relying solely on emotions to make decisions isn't always the best idea because mm -hmm. it lands them in uh, mm -hmm outcomes that they wouldn't have seen otherwise because they weren't carefully considering and that result in them not having aspects of their lives being happy right so the answer to that question is i've already been married once and i engaged in in that marriage probably more emotionally than logically and if i were to go into a marriage again likely because of the progression of my cognitive understanding of what the outcomes are going to be result resulting of that marriage i would fa i would do a more careful tabulation of the compatibility between myself and the other person and engage engage in that differently so what that would highlight for me i think is actually the opposite of what i think you're attempting to prove here what you're attempting to prove here is that we make emotional decisions that result in happiness but that's not always the case making emotional decisions is actually solely emotional decisions sometimes feels right because it feels feels being the operative term feels a certain kind of way so we think that good feeling that we have at the moment somehow is reflective of the accuracy of our decisions or like the efficacy of them and the long-term viability for our lives. But your question itself highlights that that's not necessarily the case. So if your argument is that making emotional choices is something that we do and the outcomes of it are something that we should always see as, you know, valuable or good, then my answer to your question kind of defeat that really, because you need to have such that you can't ignore your emotions. You have a limbic system. There's not really much you can do about it. So you're going to have emotions, but just having emotions doesn't mean that you should only go off of emotions. The more you understand about how emotions operate and understand neuroanatomy and cognitive function, the more you realize that emotions can kind of overwhelm logical decisions that oh, force you into a position where you're actually at a detriment instead of being in a better position because you relied on emotions instead of logic. Does that help answer your question? Well, I think the way you looked at it sounded, and you know what, you were on point and I basically agreed with everything. The point I was making though, was that like, like, let's say, um, like there's a lot of, Wait, I've, hold I've on, hold on. Cases, right. Of people leaving. I'm sorry. Are, are what are you are okay. you saying that you have a, a different way to prove that we think with something other than our brain? Well, what I'm saying though is science, and they've been researching this a lot, is that um, are the flora in, in our gut right? Actually, I'm talking about nose receptors, Jack. Like, let me, Jack. Jack, the, the the flora in your gut. I know what studies you're talking about. What you're talking about right now is nociceptors. So there's neurons that are in your body. If you're going to keep talking about this, I think you should understand it a little bit better because there's something called a blood-brain okay, barrier, course, right? Yeah. So, so some there, mm -hmm. you're like the the stuff that's in your body. There's a blood-brain barrier that prevents it essentially from getting into your brain. So your gut flora, as you refer to it, or fauna, like what happens in your, like your gut bacteria, which they are starting to look at and in, in sometimes in relation to autism spectrum disorder, <laughs> doesn't actually somehow get into your brain. That's not how it works. But what you do have in your body are neurons called nociceptors. Nociceptors are periphery neurons. Those are neurons that exist in your skin, in your stomach, in your body. They send sensations through your spinal column all the way up through your reticular formation and into your brain. Most of it is something that we're not consciously aware of. 80% of nociceptor transmissions that go up the spinal column terminate at the reticular formation. Otherwise, all we'd feel all day is our clothes touching our body and it would drive us insane, right? So Gut bacteria can have an effect on nociceptors that line the walls of the stomach, as well as nociceptors, things like uh, C fibers and like short twitch like fibers that transmit into the back of the spinal column and then go up to your brain in order to give you messages. Now, if you have some sort of like 
a disordered uh, subcognition because the, this is something that, that happens subconsciously in and around the reticular formation, there is a chance that those nociceptor messages that are essentially just saying, yes, this is still happening, yes, this is still happening, that usually don't make it to your consciousness, can make it through to your consciousness due to a deficiency. That's not the regular way that things happen, but it does happen sometimes if there's a deficiency. And because these are the types of signals that aren't supposed to go to your brain, really for conscious processing, they're supposed to be in the cerebral structures of your brain for your autonomic processing. If one of them bleeds through into your actual um, cortical areas, it can cause like diffused and, and difficult cognition because it's not really something that's necessarily supposed to be there. Now, if you read through the studies, that's what you're probably looking at. It's not gut rot, it's not bacteria in your system having a specific effect, it's that those types of nociceptors that, that read that the gut bacteria is taking place or have the sensation of gut bacteria in your stomach, don't terminate at the reticular formation like they usually do and get confused. So that's why, do you understand the science a little bit better now? And will you stop just saying, please, that gut bacteria makes you think different things? Psychology, because clearly you've done your research and if we were to debate psychology, I would lose. So I studied neuroscience. <laughs> That is why it is better, yeah, in my so, opinion, to start asking questions when when you have at least somebody who who oh, can yeah. who can help you. So so my question for you now is: Do you still believe that we think with it something other than our brain? I think that consciousness, and you use the word consciousness, which was about what I was going to mention. No, I said I think consciousness. I did. Oh, well, you did. Okay, thinking consciousness. It's okay. Well. Our, our awareness, our consciousness, our thinking process, I think mm -hmm. that the brain functions as a form of receiver of consciousness rather than creator of consciousness. That's where I no. disagree with most atheists. Why? Why do you think that? Based like on what? Like based on what understanding you would receiver. help? Like, based on what? Okay, so if I mm -hmm. said to you that, for example... If, if the brain is receiving consciousness, that means that it's a medium that something is being transmitted to, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Right? That's what it would have to mean, right? Like something outside of us is transmitting to our brain. Okay, so now explain to me. If I mispronounce it, I'm sorry. Pineal yeah, no, no, you're fine. So I need you to explain to me then, Hello? if your brain is just a receiver for messages, for signals that happen outside, how it is that I can right. augment. Okay, so how it is that I can augment those neural transmissions through neural pharmacology, how I can like do brain surgeries that will actually change uh, the constitution of your your sense of self. And also like, even if you go down to the cellular level, every neuron that fires in your brain is firing because of, there's a concentration of sodium and potassium ions on either side of a cell membrane. And inside those cell membranes of the neurons that are giving the neurotransmitters off is a mitochondria and that mitochondria produces a chemical called ATP and that ATP opens the channels between the outside and inside of that cell membrane so that those sodium and potassium ions can travel back and forth and only when they get to the point that there is a, a disparate amount on one side or the other does the electrical impulse required to create that neuronal action potential to fire that neuron to send you the message so that we can even have this conversation take place. So I would like you to tell me how something outside of your brain can change the amount of sodium and potassium ions on either side of a cell membrane in your brain in order to receive the messages. Does it like, does it use well, little you, neurotransmitters? It's an electromagnetic field, right? It's not creating an electromagnetic field. It's we creating an action potential. We send, we, we not send a field. electrical impulses from our brain down our spine through our, our um, nervous system, right? Kind of. Yes. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is anytime you send electricity in a specific direction. So when I learned about electricity and magnets, the way they taught us oh. was when you move magnets around a wire, you create oh. electricity. And if you want to use a motor, you basically send electricity and can create motion. But anyway, okay. um, so electricity is a force that permeates the universe, right? So I believe that consciousness is also a type of force, right? You didn't answer um, my question though. You, like you shifted it off. You shift it off. You're saying, you're saying that there's something that exists outside of us that is us, and that our brain is just the rec receiver for that, right? Well, the brain is just the receiver. Quite. I believe that. Okay, that is what you initially. Well, I believe that. So what I'm trying to say is that I believe God is essentially the source of all consciousness. 
Okay, God hold on, Jack, Lord. Jack, 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 hold on really quick. I'm so sorry. Shannon just explained mm -hmm. a whole bunch to you about how the brain yeah. works and, and the functions and, uh -huh. and she's, she's studied, so that's the evidence that we have. She's studied this, right? Can mm -hmm. you explain yeah. a God in any kind of a similar fashion? Can you give us information the way that she no. did? Because I don't have a degree in psychology and I'm not nearly as educated as her. So do you think that you needed a field. degree in psychology to believe in a God? No, I don't. I actually think that a lot of times people, um, it's interesting because a lot of scientists believe in God. And well, not, not a lot, but, that, but that's not the point. That's, that's a completely separate argument. Well, a fair no, 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 Jack, that's a separate argument. Well, we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about why you believe there is a God, even though mm -hmm. you have, you can't explain it. Well, I took shrooms about a month ago. So, <laughs> so you think because you took that, shrooms, kind of that's that's evidence for a god? I am no shrooms isn't the evidence for God. I do you have any? Like, like, what? like we, Shannon uh, has seen evidence of a brain. I, I mean, I've seen evidence mm -hmm. of a brain. We know brains exist. We know we can. She's studied how they function. She's just explained a bunch to you. Do you have anything like mm -hmm. that? For a god, anything like what? Like, like, like the like evidence a, a that we just book? discussed. Like, can I point you to a textbook that proves that God exists? No. No, I'm saying, can you describe to me in your own words what a god is? This is my definition of God: the source of all consciousness, um, the creation of everything in the universe, and essentially. The purpose of life. What in is my he made of? After I had this experience. What is he made what? of? Um, well, God is essentially everything. Um, and so. Wait, wait. So the then why have, of, why? Hold on, hold on, hold on. If God is everything, mm -hmm. then why not just use the mm -hmm. word everything? Mm -hmm. I can use just, I can use the word everything as a placeholder for God. Mm -hmm. No. So why? So let me no? explain what I mean. So, I can explain if you'd like. Please. It'd be neat. Okay, so what is something that a God, if, if God is omniscient and knows all things, what is what is that God unable to do? I don't know what a God is yet. Experience surprise. Okay, well, I still don't know what a God is. Theorize. Because you said it's everything. Wasn't. So what can everything do? Well, everything can do a lot. Mm -hmm. Everything can do anything. You just literally said, if God can do literally anything, is there anything he can't do? I mean, the answer to that question is, if you define a God as someone who can do anything, then obviously not. You can't define things into truth and then be and act like that's a mic drop, which is what you just did. You just said, well, if God can do everything, then he can do everything. So there. I mean, fine. Do you hear yourself, Jack? Do you hear yourself? Or novelty. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm at my wit's end because we like we're every time I feel like we're just about to get to something like yeah. it seems like the conversation shifts and we go to like something completely unrelated. Okay. Like, oh, okay. I'm uncomfortable talking about this anymore because we've hit a wall. So now right. let's talk about this instead. And we could do that ad infinitum and I don't want to. So I'm going to bid you adieu and thank you very much. I enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> I love any opportunity I have to talk about brains and it's not my turn anymore. It's your turn now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So let's talk to Christian in California. It says, do you're an atheist. Do atheists have the duty to attempt to deconvert people? Oh, uh, first, I'd like to know what you think, Christian. What's up, Christian? Hi there. Um, this is my first time uh, making it onto the call. Um, the atheist Hi. experience actually got me questioning four years ago. Um, yeah, I'm only 20 years old, um, but in Catholic school, it got me to kind of deconvert. Um, wow. and so for a while, my, uh, for a while, my approach to it was really just like, um, I guess, you know, uh, uh, agree to disagree, you know, let it be because mm -hmm. in a Catholic school, I heard this all the time, you know, from family, from friends and, you know, in our society, we hear it all the time, you know, people thanking God, you know, people praying all over the place. Um, so 
it's not like I'm going to go up and debate everyone on the street, right? You know, um, you know, with my pocketbook of street epistemology. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, sometimes um, I I feel like it is important to bring it up, right? So yeah. I wanted to see. I've only been an atheist for about three or four years now, um, and I wanted to see um, more like veteran ater- uh, atheists um, <laughs> to to see what your experience with that is. Um, to see uh, if you've ever had to go through that with like maybe I shouldn't say anything or like maybe this is a chance to get someone to um to like see a breakthrough or something. Um well you've been an atheist longer than I have. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh well, um, okay. that. So Shannon. <laughs> so yeah, what do you have to tell Jenna? You're like <laughs> what advice do you have for Jenna as a new atheist? <laughs> I've been an atheist for longer. So so would you just you you'd like to know what we both think? Is that what you're trying to say? Right. Um, I don't know what your position is that, how or is on that and how you go about it in your daily lives, that kind of stuff. Shannon, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Sorry, a cat came to visit me. <laughs> um <laughs> currently holding a tiny cat, she's gone now. Um so I would say it's entirely uh dependent upon the situation that you're in, right? Like if you it, going out you know street preaching on the corner like about the why people should be atheists and making every conversation you have about belief is a really quick way to just entirely alienate yourself from a lot of people so i think you have to pick your moments um the moments that i pick this would be the advice that i give outside of like this online realm when where i engage in it just on a pretty consistent basis because it's kind of what i do as an activist here which which is different than just like a regular you know, somebody who wants to have these conversations day to day, very different, right? You're going to conduct them in a different manner because you're also, you're not just thinking about um, what that person believes. You're thinking about relationship retention with that person, which requires a completely different engagement strategy. And something I see a lot is that people use the same sort of engagement strategies that they see modeled on shows like this when they're in their real life with people. And that's not always the best fit based on the way that that relationship dynamic works. So I guess my advice would be um, assess the relationship dynamic and augment your engagement strategy based on that. But my um, view of it is I don't necessarily bring it up, but when I see it brought up and it is causing harm in my real life or it has the potential to cause harm, um, I engage at that point. But I don't come in hot to family dinners going, guess what, guys? I don't even think that Jesus rose. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, everybody, <laughs> gather around. We're going to talk about how the how the philosophical definitions of God are all incoherent and don't comport with Scripture. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta figure out a strategy. I guess would be my best advice. And those are going right, to be right. That's, that's exactly where I'm at with it right now. Because, yeah. um, so I don't. Know, I care about other people. I care about the society that I share with other people. So, you know, it, in, in a, in everyday conversation, if someone points or says something that's wrong, or I point it out, I, or I'm able to point it out, I'll point it out. Right. Just because, right. you know, I don't, you know, want them to keep holding false belief, but if it's held so deeply and by so many people in our society, um, it becomes very different. So like you said, like, I'm not going to go up, you know, to like my grandma on Thanksgiving and be like, uh, your, you know, beliefs are, you know, unsubstantiated. Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, when your dad's your dad, right, yeah. Grandma? Like, that's just not a thing that you do. Yeah, <laughs> if anything, yeah. I'd say that family family situations are almost the last time that you want to start talking about that because you've got so much history with them. You know, mm-hmm. there's so much emotion there already. So personally, I think family gatherings, especially last place, first place would be, you know, a, just a casual conversation um, with a friend that you, you know, haven't seen in a while and they're wondering what's going on and you're catching up. I personally just kind of casually mention it and then see if they're interested in discussing it further. And if they ask me a question, then I know that they're interested. But if they, which typically they just don't say anything, if they don't say anything, then I just move on. I I don't want to pressure people into having that conversation because one, that puts their guard up against me. And two, that puts their guard up against any kind of questioning. So I personally just like, just like Shannon said, try to gauge the situation, try to determine when it's appropriate. The thing is that I I probably take every opportunity um, because there is so much harm. Like even if it's, say it's like an extended family gathering, like, I don't know, like a birthday, you know, something that's a little bit more casual than Thanksgiving or something. 
and you know, there's an aunt and uncle in from out of town. You haven't seen them for a while, whatever. I personally, I love bringing that up and then just kind of in a nice friendly way saying something like, oh yeah, this is what I'm doing in a nice way. And sometimes they're a little bit more interested in taking me up on that. Um, if, if you try to show them that you're not going to be like, okay, so now we've got to discuss, mm. we've got, we've got to take this seriously. Right. Like, okay. I feel like, you know, I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, it, what actually got me thinking about this, um, more recently, uh, you know, a particular experience was that I was around, um, step family. Um, and, uh, someone told me that like, oh, you should start going to church. And I just said, oh, well, I'm not really religious. Perfect. Um, and she said, well, you should be. And it just ended oh. like that. Um, mm. and, you know, I, I've heard from I... other people in the family that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I guess her favorite anymore. <laughs> so oh, well. I don't know. That Is wouldn't that have ended like that to me. Right? You're, you're a nicer person than I am. <laughs> I would have, that in that situation, that's not you bringing it up. It's an entirely different situation. That's somebody using your lack of belief as a cudgel to create an impression of you as a person. And that is something that you should all, like you should never ever, like if, if you're, if you have the emotional bandwidth for it, allow somebody the room in your life to do that to you. Cause that can be abusive, right? Right, if like you, you say that she's, that. you're not her favorite person anymore, but it should be you kind of taking a stance for yourself or it could not should, but could be you yeah. saying, you know, please don't enforce your beliefs on me or please, you know, that that's a personal subject. Or um, question I would ask would be, okay, if, if we're judging us, judging each other based on our beliefs, should I think differently of you because you believe differently of me? Like that would be a good mirror question. So is that what we're basing our assessments of each other on? Is this the way that we should be formulating relationships? Because it's going to tell you a lot about how that person does come to determinations on relationships or it'll tell that person a lot about how they form those opinions that they maybe weren't aware of previously themselves because they just take for granted because society kind of has this monopoly on religion being a synonym for virtue that when you say that you're not religious that somehow means you lack virtue as a result because they're seen as so synonymous so when you push that in their face in a gentle way by saying well could you explain to me what about me not believing in God changes anything about me? Should we be basing how our relationship operates on what we do or do not believe? Why is a God belief different than other beliefs when it comes to us having disagreements? That those are those would be good mirror questions to highlight to that person that, hey, are you really making the best decision here? Are you sacrificing a relationship because you have faulty thinking? And if their answers are unsatisfactory, it'll tell you about whether or not that's somebody you need to distance yourself from. Amen, sister. I wish I wrote all of that down. <laughs> hey, you know what? This is on YouTube you. forever. Forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, definitely watch this and think about some things. Um, and then I just have one more thing I wanted to talk about um, before you guys hang up on me. Um, so Shannon, you mentioned that like, you know, if, if it's something that's like, I don't know, it causes harm or, you know, someone's in danger because of it, you're probably more likely to, um, I don't know, try to persuade them otherwise. Right. Or, you know, yeah. be like, Hey, you know, this is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the way I see it, you know, religion is very harmful. Um, and it, I think it does more harm than good. Um, so what do you think about it in terms of that? Because, you know, like my grandma, I, I don't really, you know, talk to her too, too much anymore. And I've kind of just become convinced that, you know, I'm never going to tell her I'm an atheist. And, you know, it's just going to go like that for, you know, the rest of our relationship. Um, mm -hmm. So at what point, you know, should I say like, hey, this is damaging or, you know, anything like that? That's up to you. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Like you can go the rest of your life. You don't see being an atheist as, or, or I shouldn't say you don't, I don't. And I'm imagining you're, you might be similar to me. I don't see being an atheist as a defining attribute of who I am as a person. Right. And those are the types of things that are valuable in familiar relationships, like a relationship with your grandma. If it's not something that consistently comes up against, like if it's not something that you're consistently having to perform theism in order to hide your belief, then that's a different thing. But if it's not an, a, a component of your dynamic, there's no need to bring it up 
unless, like I said, you see religion as entering into that relationship or their relationship with the world, um, causing damage to them or to themselves or others. And then you have to figure out an engagement strategy and whether or not you have the emotional bandwidth to engage. And that's not something that's always going to be the same. It may not be the same for you one day for to another, and it may not be the same for you as it ever is for me. And that's okay. That's going to be very, very individualistic. I'm not sure if that helped at all, but that would be my perspective on it. All right, Christian. Thank you. This was a lovely call. All right. Thank you. I don't know what happened. I think we, we lost him, but that was good timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to pick the next one? I think I picked the Okay, one. sure. Oh, we can pick the one. Oh, we're oh, calling out. Evidently, what's talking. happening? <laughs> we lost a screener. I think they're back in though. Okay. Oh, gosh. I'm not ready. Okay. Um, oh, no. All in studio. Oh, I see. I think I can see them. Okay. We'll talk to David. I think this will probably be the last one, too. Okay. Hello, oh, David. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, what would you like to talk about today? You're talking to Shannon and Jenna. I couldn't pronounce my own name there. Shannon. <laughs> Shannon. Well, how much time do we have? Uh, nine minutes. Unless you frustrate <laughs> me sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What would you talk about? I just wanted to say that that pretty much everybody, atheists and Christians and whoever's in the world, we all operate on faith. How do you know that? Because everything, because from the time we're born, everybody's just assimilating information. And how do we determine whether that information is true or not? Okay. How are you using that word faith? Well, we're trusting our parents when we're young, they're training us to do something. And so we're just, are, are you using them. faith as a synonymous word for trust? Well, in that situation, I would say, yeah, I would, I'm trusting my parents. So in what situation would it not be trust? Because, well, if you knew the information, it wouldn't be trust. So but I'm trying to define I mean, faith. I'm trying to get your definition of faith. And you said that it's like trust. And so I'm trying to understand if I can use the word trust instead of the word faith, if those mean the same thing to you. If they don't mean the same thing, then I'd like to know what the word faith means. Well, I'm, I'm using it the same way you use it to believe anything you believe. You don't know how I use so it. So I'd like to know how you use it. And then I'll tell you if I use it the same way. Well, I'm telling you, as a child, I, I just accepted and trusted what my parents told me that it was. So true. are you using faith as a synonymous well, word for trust? Yes or no? Yes. OK, so That's then why don't we do? Them. I can agree. We all trust. We can agree on that. We use the word faith differently. So I, I think that if this is a semantical error, if that is all you're trying to say is that everyone trusts. Well, I'm trying to say that we all learn things and and a lot of us learn things that are not true and we accept them as true from the time we're born that sure. is correct that's all i'm saying and yep. so and so even you you have a, a criteria by which you judge everything that you learn yes i do so you judge everything that you have judged everything that you learned by whatever information that you've accepted you're the you're the one that determines whether the information that passes by you is acceptable to you Correct. or not, you don't know whether it's true. Are there you better and no worse systems? To, for, are there better and worse systems to determine whether or not something you know is true, or are they all equivalent? Well, hear, because it I'm, sounds like you're saying I'm, that we all I'm, do it the I'm, same I'm, way, which I think is what you're trying to do. You're trying to say all of us have to trust at some point, and because all of us have to trust, we're all in the same boat, and you and I just did the same thing and came to different conclusions. But that's not necessarily the case. What we're saying is that we're using this sort of like epistemic framework that requires a higher burden in order for us to now incorporate that information that you may have be taking on trust as something that we perceive, perceive as real or actual or true. You're saying that I am, I am still in a position and currently see it as a viable strategy to know things, to just trust. And I'm saying that although it's something that I have done in the past and something that potentially I still do every once in a while now, 
Um, I don't see that as the best possible framework for knowing things. And when I can help it, I apply a different strategy in order to verify the things that I learn as something that I should perceive as knowledge. Can you see and, the difference? And we've actually seen evidence uh -huh. of, of harm that has come from people using that method. Well, yeah, because there's, we believe lots of things that are not true. So, and people, that's just the way people are. They're not, yeah. they don't know anything. So they're like you said, like I said, they assimilate this information. They don't know whether it's true. And so we, how do you judge whether something is true or not? Logic. Yeah, I valid. I do source methodology a lot too. Doing source methodology, I think, is an important thing. Um, what, is, I, what is that? Source methodology. Oh, so if I yeah, hear something, if I sorry, I think Jenna was asking me a question. I'll just answer logic super quickly. Then I'll let you go. But source methodology is uh, finding the ultimate source of the claim that somebody is making. Ah. So yeah, so if somebody says, "Hey," on Facebook or whatever, "Hey, did you hear that?" Blah blah blah. Election. Blah, 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 like you, you follow that trail back to the original source so that you can analyze it based on the context it was originally um, uh, okay. utilized. Yeah. So sorry, then, David. David, David sorry. Is, Thank you. So then, David. So then, that's the thing is that we we can all use many different ways to try to find out what's true, <clears throat> but th that's the thing. We, we want to try to investigate what are the best ways. And since I discovered that we are wrong about so many things, since I didn't think that at first, and then I found out that all of us are like wrong that. about, hold on, hold on, hold on. All of us are wrong about a lot of things. And so that's why I try to take the stance of, I don't know on most things until I can find more information. Yeah. But you used to be a Christian. So how did you Correct. determine whether what the information that you were using as your logic to judge the Christianity was true or not? So that's the thing is after I started investigating that, I found out that I didn't actually have a reason. I found out that my only reasons for believing in the religion that I was brought up in was one, my family told me to, and two, Everyone pretty much that I knew and uh, kind of in my circle believed it too. Those are two major fallacies on, on whether or not it is, it is a solid reason to believe something. And so I found out I didn't have a reason. So, so that's why now I am desperately trying to find out what everyone's reason is because I found out everyone's got a different reason. So now what I'd really like to know is what is your reason? What is my reason for believing? Yes. Well, I didn't. I don't remember saying what I believed in, but I believe. Well, because, do you believe in a god? Yes. Why do you believe in that god? I believe. Because I, I found that's the thing. You think that I had a reason, and that was good, but I lost that reason. What I'm telling you is that I I discovered I never had one. What is your reason? Yeah, but you never prove that. So, what is your reason? What you believe was true or not? You. So, you, so no, no, no. Now we're not talking about me anymore. We're talking about you. What is your reason? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> well, my logic is based on the information I receive, just like your logic is based right. on the information you receive. I choose. I choose which information I choose to deem as true. Right. I In don't my own head, think right. that most of the stuff. That if we look at society today and look at most of the stuff that's going on today with all the politics. David, you know, you're not answering my question. David, you're not answering my question. I'm sorry. What is your reason? Why do I believe what I believe? Yeah. I believe because God showed me at a very young age that he was real. I mean, who did? My, my. Hold on, who did? God. God told you at a young age that he was real? I didn't hear his voice, no. So well, then how do you, so then how did this happen? Please, I need more details than that. Extra, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I'm gonna need a lot more okay. evidence than just God told me to. You know what I mean? I, I accepted Christ when I was 18 and I didn't- So what is your reason? I mean, I didn't. David, 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 well, I, I, need, I know that, I know I that you're trying, David. I know that you're trying and I really appreciate it. And I, I it just seems 
to me, like I may have caught you off guard a little bit with that question and that you don't necessarily have an answer prepared already. Would you like some more time to go and think about what your reason is? No. Okay, then can you give it to me straightforward? Just like my reason yeah. was that I was told to believe it by people that I knew and trusted and everybody that I encountered basically believed it as well. Those were the main reasons that I believed. Those were not logical reasons. So what are your yes, reasons are so we can investigate them as whether or not they are logical reasons to believe in something? It's perfectly logical to believe in Jesus based on what your parents told you because no, it's not logic. No, 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 we no, no, all no. learn. No, that's like, we need to talk about your, why your it's parents not are bad people. What if your parents tell you to believe? What if your parents had told you to believe in the devil? What if your, well, your dad was Hitler? You're, if you're using that logic, you're just the, like literally what you're saying is we should just accept what our parents say to us is true. That's reasonable. And that blows my mind. Do you, do you hear? No, your, but do, I have, do, you really, do you really think that I though? I don't really have any choice. I don't really have any choice in that situation. Well, I only have not? the information they give me. I only Wait, have the information they give me. Is wrong? Make a decision with me. You think that your parents cannot possibly be wrong? Oh, man. Well, I, I think everybody can be wrong. I'm just so saying. Why are your parents unique I, in that you can trust I, no, matter, only, no matter what they say? I'm just saying that my information is limited, especially at 18 year old, years old. I don't know much. You're not 18 so, now. And so I okay, have, so hold on, hold on. So, so you're an 18 year old with parents. So, hold on, hold on. So you're an 18 year old with parents. Why should you, and I mean, any 18 year old with any parents, good, bad, whatever, you're saying that no matter what, because you're 18, you have to accept everything that your parents tell you as truth, as, as solid fact, just because they're your parents? Well, I only have the information they give me and what I've learned in school, and I don't know what I learned in school was true either. How do I so know have that? You ever, have you ever heard of skepticism? Yeah, I used to be a skeptic. So what is, what is a skeptic? What does skeptic, skeptical mean? I still, am, I still am pretty skeptical. I need evidence generally when I... It's like for climate change, I need evidence for that. I can't just believe that some scientist said it's true. Okay. I need evidence. Okay. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing with evolution. So we're not talking, about, we're talking about your parents. Hold on. Stick to the subject, please. We're trying to figure out whether or not you should blindly accept what your parents tell you. And we are under the impression that it is absolutely <laughs> a bad idea because your parents can be anybody. And you and I both agree that anybody is wrong all the time about something something right so so you should not yeah. just trust your parents correct well i i have to trust them to a degree because they love me enough to take care of me till i was 18 what if they don't what if they hate you they don't well what if they do because you're making a blanket statement for everybody on the planet just because it can apply to you do you realize that No, I think that applies to everybody. If their parents love them, at least, I mean, at least and if, if they, they don't, they them. just don't count. So you're setting no, up a special don't. set of circumstances where you're saying, okay, nobody else should do this. This isn't really a good way to acquire knowledge, but my mom and dad loved me. So, and, and then that's another whole separate set of a fallacy yeah. too, right? Because you're also saying like, no. even if we grant you that you have this special set of circumstances that exist just for you and no one else should have it where you can trust your parents because they love you. Like, we'll grant that, right? You, but that still doesn't make them right, right? That still doesn't, well, uh, get, doesn't set up a criteria well, from which we can look to say, how do we assess whether assess and determine whether or not the information being presented to us is right or wrong? What framework can we utilize for that? Saying people feed, people who love me can feed me information and I should just believe it is not only fallacious, it's dangerous. Do you see whether that? your parents love you or not? Think, they could love you think, and be I wrong. Do you do you see what she's saying, David? I think Yes, Shannon, you you're absolutely perfect.
<laughs> oh my god! Well, I'm, okay, I, I'm, I agree. I'm gonna hang up. I'm not perfect. I'm I'm tired. I'm cranky. And that when somebody responds to what I'm saying, like I am not perfect. There's the the amount of things I don't know is the size of the universe, and the amount of things I do know could probably fit in a thimble comparatively. I understand that, and I have been wrong a billion and a half times, probably seven times today, and I've probably said five things wrong on this call. Me saying that just trusting somebody well irrespective of whether or not they love you to feed you information and to just assume that that information is true and that that is a viable and realistic reasonable way to determine the truth of reality is not an acceptable way to look at the world is not me saying that i am perfect and have perfect knowledge and can acquire perfect knowledge i am essentially just saying almost any system's better than that fucking one Anyway, sorry, I got cranky. I'm tired. <laughs> well, <laughs> what well, is the end of the show, actually? Uh, so one more time, I want to thank the crew because they're just Woo! kind of awesome, you know. Amazing. We love oh, you. I love you all. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you're funny. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining. I hope that you had a good time, and we'll see you next week. No, yeah, bye guys. What will it take for you to start?